We want to welcome everybody to our new show, Southern Outdoors on WKM News and it's sponsored today by Anderson Sales and Service. They have two uh, stores now, one in Madison and one in Crestwood. We're here with Andy Crozier who we don't see out and about very often anymore and we've got Tim Beck here. So um, Andy can you tell us what you're doing now because obviously we don't see you. Right, yeah. I've had that question quite a bit. People ask me if I retired and uh, no I haven't really retired but I took another position. It's called the District Administrative Sergeant for uh, District 9 which is the southeast corner of Indiana, 11 counties, and I am in the office at uh, Versailles State Park. And I handle all the, pretty much all the paperwork, some of the purchasing, things like that for the district, right. for the officers. So, so you enjoy that? I, I, I do enjoy it, uh, not as much as get out in the field, you know, that, that's part of the job that I do miss, right. but uh, with this job, you know, for 26 years I work nights, weekends, you guys saw me all the time. Uh, now I work Monday through Friday, pretty much a straight shift and and I'm off evenings and weekends and my, my wife and my kids really do enjoy that part of it. That's, so. that's good to be with your family. It is. But you're still there for informational purposes. People oh, yes. can call you yeah. and ask you questions. And I'll be in the Monday through Friday I'm in the office. If you got any questions just call up the at the post up there at 812-689-4370 and I'll probably be the one to answer the phone. So. And, and that's any question. There, there's no question that is a dumb question. Oh, right. The only dumb question is one that's never asked because it doesn't have an answer. Right. So I, if you have a question of any kind, give Andy a call and uh, he'll steer you in the right direction or give you the answer that you right. need. I'd rather you call me and ask me the question than, than have one of our officers have to write you a citation in yes. the field. Because yes. that gets pretty costly anymore. Yeah. So. Besides losing property. Uh, Possible. Yeah. Mainly it's the fines, the late, they hit your pocket pretty good. <laughs> so, and then uh, Tim, I understand that there's actually some courses that are specifically targeted for women nowadays, but it wasn't like when I was a kid. As um, soon as I was big enough to go out, I was helping my dad train hunting dogs and English setters and reloading shotgun shells and things. And now women don't have that chance when they're young, but when they get older, they decide they want to go out and go with their husband or go with some friends and skeet shoot or go deer hunting. So there's a special class for them now. Oh yeah, we have uh, a lot of uh, recreational classes anymore through the law enforcement division. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the one that you're talking about the most that's really popular with women is the Becoming an Outdoor Woman's program. Yes. Uh, basically it got started in Wisconsin and uh, a lot of the states across the country picked up this program and uh, we've been doing it now for quite a while and uh, it's the popularity of this program is just off the wall. Uh, yeah. We open the registrations up for it and usually within a week, not even a week, we fill up. And this last year we had 120 women uh, participating in the program. So it is very unique. I think that's great in order to inform them and help them learn how to be outdoors and be outdoors safely. Yeah, it covers everything. It covers a wide variety of topics, not only the shooting sports side of it. That's what I'm involved with mostly. I'm one of two coordinators for the outdoor education right. section. And uh, myself and Chris Clark, uh, coordinate these programs along with the staff right. and what we do is we do a lot of the shooting sports activities like the rifles and pistols and shotguns and mm -hmm. archery equipment and then some of the hunting side of things but also at Become an Outdoor Woman they do everything from kayaking to Dutch oven cooking, how to back a trailer, uh, uh, they do wood carving and right. fur, woodcraft and uh, fur craft actually making some hats and that out of fur so it's a pretty comprehensive program that the women and again it's all women and it's that's what it's about it's right. the women to have a weekend to learn some stuff that maybe they don't get the chance to do at home oh i think that's wonderful i really do and, and there's different venues that do that we have the, the one for the state the yeah. oaks here locally has one the first saturday in june every year so there uh, that means there's three then well the big one is the one that we right. do at the state the but they point. have these satellite programs all across the state mm -hmm. that they have a weekend or a one-day program and uh, we encourage our properties and that to do it and it's become very very popular i mean uh I mean, we get everybody from 18 to, I think our oldest one we had was uh, 83. So, oh, I mean, it's a, it's really, it's a hoot. It's a good time and the women are very passionate. I've always said for years since I've been doing this now for close to 30 years is that that's one of my favorite programs to do because the women genuinely are interested in learning. Yeah. A lot of times they don't have the bad habits that the guys sometimes do. So it's been a very rewarding program because they come and they want to learn and, and it's, it's exciting to see a smile on their face and that first accomplishment of busting that clay target. Or, yeah. It's neat. Oh, wow. Well, they come back a class or two late, a year or two late, they'll yes. come back. You know, several topics, they'll do mm. you know, a couple of them a year is all they can do, two or three or four, depending on the, uh, on the venue. But 
they'll come back a couple years and look at the elk I killed. You know, and they, they never hunted before the becoming yeah. outdoors woman class. And and you were talking about they you know they go out their husbands or or or, or brothers or you uh -huh. know, other. Some of them hunt on their own now. I, yes. We check more women in the field than ever yeah. hunting on their own. They're not you know the barrier is not there anymore. They're not afraid yes. to go out and 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 hunt on their own. And uh, you know it's it's a great thing to see because you know yeah. it's a tradition in this country that needs to be enjoyed by all, you know, whether it be adults, children, women, men, and, uh, you know, I've, I for one, it really, you know, I get a kick out of watching a woman that's not a, not afraid to do it herself, you know, I've taught my daughter to do that, yes. and uh, she, uh, you know, she'll go do hunting by herself when dad had to work, so. I just think that's awesome, I mean, when I was younger, there weren't a lot of women that went hunting, you know, so I was kind of the odd person, you I'll know. tell you what, like Andy met the participation level of women now has really started climbing big time. We're not only seeing it in Indiana, but uh, yes. across the country. country. And it's really, it is, it's a neat, it's a good reversal. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a lot of years, we've had a de uh, decline in hunting, you yes. know, the people that go out hunting. And with all the efforts that a lot of people have put forward and a lot of organizations and that put out, we're actually starting to see a climb back of uh, people getting outdoors and enjoying hunting and doing it. So it is exciting and women play a big role in that. So uh, anything we can do to foster that, we're all for it. Well, I'm glad you guys take the time to do it. I mean, it's wonderful that you do that and that you make sure the program is successful. Oh, it's... So. Uh, it's like I said, it's amazing how fast it fills up. I can remember in the early days, we may have registration open for a month, month and a half, but I mean, they're watching the computer now, we're watching a <laughs> website, they're watching Facebook, and, and of course now we try to utilize all the, uh, the different avenues that right. we can, social media, and I mean, if we're a uh, second late on getting that registration up, we're, uh, we get notified <laughs> real quick, so yeah. Yeah. it's kind of neat. So now that class is in the spring. Yeah, we do it the first weekend in May is first when we do it. The facility we use is in up by Purdue University, so yes. West Lafayette. Uh, it's called Ross Camp. It's run by the Tippecanoe County Park Board. But uh, along with the Indiana Hunter Ed Association, it's an, uh, an organization that partnered with the law enforcement division to bring some of these programs. Mm -hmm. We've kind of made that our base camp or whatever. Uh, uh, believe it or not, it's sometimes hard to find the facilities where you can do all these activities that we want to do and have some place where a good dining hall, right. uh, facilities for people to sleep, uh, for the staff to be there right. that will allow you to shoot the guns and the bows yes. and the arrows and then have access to water. So it becomes really a challenge and Ross Camp up there by West Lafayette has been great and like I say, the Tippecanoe County Park Board has been fabulous to work with. So we kind of make that our home base now and, and so that's where it's held right. at and we have a a lot of things that we can do up there so it's really one of those benefits of having a nice home place where we can go oh I think that's awesome and then some of the things that we were talking about earlier were safety as far as going hunting and things like um, we were talking about a friend of mine that didn't think he needed to be tied off in a tree stand mm. fell out of that tree stand and broke most of his ribs and realized he should have been tied off and had to crawl out of the woods it took him four hours to get out Right. So there's there's things that we need to make sure people understand. You need to be safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, years ago, uh, probably our number one hunting accident before before the advent of the hunter orange law, where people had to wear hunter orange when they were gun yes. hunting. You know, our, our number one you know accident was was people being shot by other hunters, or, right? Because they couldn't see them, or or or, uh, or they mistook them for game. But that number, with the advent of the hunter orange laws, you know, some people don't don't like it. Uh, you know, the animals don't see hunter orange, but it's it's the only color. That's not found in nature. Yes. And when when the light starts to fade, you know, in the morning when the sun's coming up or it starts to fade, that orange, that fluorescent orange, actually starts to grow. Yes. Or to glow, not grow, glow. <laughs> but it looks you, you you won't see the person walking, but you can see the orange hat maybe right. going through. You know, so you can pick it out. But um, you know, today it's people falling out of tree stands. Yes. That every every tree stand manufacturer in the country sells a tree stand has a safety harness in it yes and it's a five-point harness it goes around your legs you know the old the old safety strap that went around your chest found out that kill you just as quick as falling out of the stand because you hung there and it just right. it just it just constricted you like yes. a boa constrictor uh so they you know it kept from hitting the ground but a lot of times we found you hanging dead in the tree right um now they have the the five point body harness and it's amazing i could not tell you a percentage i don't know but a lot of hunters still do not use it. Yes. It comes with a video of how to use it. It's easy to use. Um, a lot of times it's hard to get the, the old the old gold dogs to, you know, change the way they've hunted yeah. for years. It's just like the SIBO lot. The kids today, most of them, they've had to put on the life, it's automatic. They jump in, they put it on, they don't think yes. about it. You still, you know, when it first came into effect, 
people fought it forever. They didn't want to do it. Um, so it, if, if I could tell anybody to, the, the one thing in hunting, if you're going to be off the ground, I don't care how far, wear that, wear that, that safety harness yeah. because that, that is going to keep you alive. Um, you might hang there a while before we find you, but at least we'll find you alive. Um, it, it's easier to find you hanging from a tree than laying on the ground. Well, the metal steps on it, when the dew hits it, they're slick. They're slick, they break off, they're still you know? screwing steps. Yeah. I've, uh, I've seen them, you know, one break off and the next one really just about mm -hmm. guts the guy. Yeah. You know, it just, they, they run right down through it. So you want to, you know, you want to be, I'm not here to promote any type of tree stand, you know, the climber versus the, right. the ladder. They all have their advantages, disadvantages, and, and every one of them is dangerous if not used correctly. Mm -hmm. So they come with instructions. Make sure you follow those instructions. Follow all the safety equipment that comes with them, and, and you're going to go home at night. You yeah. know, I'm not going to get that call at midnight from the wife that says, well, my husband went hunting this afternoon. He's not home yet. And, and you know, then, you know. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to go make that trip to the house and, right. and tell her that her husband's not coming home at all. And that's so, not a, it's not a good thing to have happen. Yeah. But you know, there's one, there's one statement you always hear, and it, it it's kind of, it, it's contradictory. So, well, he, he, he died doing what he loved. I don't want to die doing what I love. I want to <laughs> keep doing it. You know. So, uh, you know, it, it's something that's said, but I, I, you know, if you really think about it, it's like, I don't want to die deer hunting. I don't want to die no. fishing. I, you know, I want to. I want to wake up dead. That's what I always said. Just go to bed one night and not wake up. But, I, you know, that's, that's just, you know, one of those statements you hear a lot and think, you really think about that. Well, <laughs> you know? I definitely don't want to die in the woods. Yeah. I'd but, rather be out. And I agree totally. I mean, the Indiana Hunter Education Program, um, that's one of our big focuses. Believe it or not, like it said, our biggest incident that we have every year is people falling out of tree stands. And... I know for 16 plus years it has been a push at every Indiana Hunter Ed class that our instructors and our officers mm -hmm. spend time and talk about tree stand safety. And, and you know, we call it tree stand safety, but any kind of elevated platform yes. is what we're referring to. If you're coming up off the ground, you need to wear yeah. that safety harness. And uh, we've done numerous uh, attempts at, you know, at state fairs, county fairs, right. uh, any kind of uh, promotion that we can do to do it. But uh, it's one of those things that why we don't understand they don't do it, but it, it is our biggest deal. I mean, it's like Andy said, if you swinging on game or another hunter shooting another hunter, those were the common ones at times, but now just about opening day of the season. There'll be somebody. There'll be somebody fall yeah. out of that tree stand. And if we can, man, it, it doesn't take long. It's not that much of an inconvenience. They're actually making the harnesses now where they're like vests yes. and they become part of your hunting outfit. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes very little time to get into it. But yeah, it's it's one of those things that just, and for your friend that fell, you know, believe it or not, it sounded really bad, but he was one of the lucky ones. He yes. was able to crawl right. yes. and he only had broken ribs. We know individuals that have died yes. are now permanently paralyzed in, and never going to be able to do what they love right. to hunt again. And uh, so, yeah, you, you, the key thing you said with all our programs is safety. Yes. Uh, every program that we do, whether it's becoming an outdoor woman program, mm -hmm. uh, the law enforcement division is also responsible for the 4-H shooting sports program in Indiana, training the adult right. volunteers. Uh, regardless what program it's at, safety is our number mm -hmm. one rule. We're in the middle of our camp season right now. We just finished our annual uh, conservation officers camp. It's named Carl E. Kelly Memorial Youth Camp. Uh, again, we meet them, the kids. I've had 120 kids show up on Sunday, Father's Day. Right. And, you know, we introduced ourselves and told them, hey, we're about ready to make 120 new friends. But our number one rule this week is safety, yes. regardless what you do. So, you know, there, we have too many neat things in Indiana not to enjoy, right. to let something careless happen. And tree stand accidents are one of yeah. them. Yeah. I think a lot of it is people get in a hurry or they think, well, I'm not going to be here very long. I'm just going to go up and and scout today and I'm going to come back down and go back to the house. But if they get off the ground at all, whether it's a man-made stand or a platform or an actual metal tree stand attached to a tree, no matter how long they're going to be out there, they just need to tie off. It doesn't take two minutes. It, it's easy to make excuses. Yes. It really is. Yes. And, and, and we're all guilty of it. But, you know, the, the vest like Tim's talking about, I hear excuses. Well, I, they cost 150 bucks. My life's worth a little over 150 bucks, I think. I don't think anybody'd give it up for that. I, I think your kids and your yeah. spouse yeah. will appreciate you spending that 150 dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, especially now, you know, one of our big efforts too is recruitment and retention, trying to get people back in the field. Right. And uh, you know, we set examples every day when we go out, how we act, what we do, what we wear. 
uh, what we do when we harvest that animal. Uh, all those things come into play and our young hunters and our young sportsmen that are out there, they mimic what we do. Yes. And it's very important that we set that example, uh, just like the seatbelt. Right. You get in, you buckle up. When right. you get out in the field and you're climbing that elevator, put yeah. that safe they're going to see that yes. it's not the cool thing to do unless you got your safe you know your safety harness now so i you know sportsmen really need to think about that we play a huge role as a role model yes. and uh, our actions what we do what we say how we act when we're with our buddies and everything how it comes into play we got ears around us constantly right. and you know it's cool to do what they did or whatever so next time they're sitting around a campfire or something something may come out we didn't necessarily want them to come out you know when uh, guys are trying to be guys or whatever right. but if we can start instilling these values in when they're young mm -hmm. it's proven that it lives with them and it continues yeah. on yeah just like the seat belt thing right. you know if they every time they go out to the tree stand whether it's a scout or actually go hunting and everybody's putting on that harness the kids just automatically do it they don't think about it twice yeah it's not an option that they do or not it needs to become so. just like your boots your mm -hmm. good hunting boots or your coveralls or what yes. it needs to become part of your hunting where you don't walk out of the or get out of the vehicle or yeah. whatever without it you so gotta exactly. you gotta get into that frame of mind uh, i think you know, I, i've walked out of my house forgot it and i just had to on go the back. ground I'd, well it's either go back and get it or if i run it late i just hunt on the ground i don't right. i won't get off the ground without it anymore right. and uh, yeah i've been to i have a a unique perspective of it because i'm the one that gets called to all the accidents yeah and and uh you're the you one know, that sees the aftermath. I've of seen not the aftermath. The I, I've had the I've had the, the hunter die right in front of me because you know yeah. he fell out, hit the ground, and he looked like he was okay. Played a little chest pain. You know, aorta was tore off the top of his heart from the impact. Oh my god! Nothing. They, if he'd been in the emergency room, an hour time saved it, him. Yeah. But you know, it, it's 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 those instances where um, you know it, it just drives it home to yourself. So yeah. I'm not going to risk it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to get up in that tree and. And like you said, in the morning when it's frosty, they're slick. So yeah, I keep a camouflage tent in my car. Yeah. So when I get to the field, no matter what, if I don't have everything I need to go in the tree stand, I just get out the tent and I sit on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, and so that brings up I an interesting that. point. There's been a big movement for ground blinds right. yes. that people are starting to use, whether they're homemade or they, you know, a lot of right. commercial ones out there. And Indiana has a new law, and Andy can dwell on a little bit as far as the hunter urge requirement on ground blinds. Right. Yes. Well, if, if you use a ground blind during the during the deer gun season, yes. when the gun seasons are open, even if you're archery hunting, if a gun season is open, a farm season is open, yeah. you have to have a uh, hunter orange on Somewhere. that blind. Well, it has to be visible from all four okay. sides. Uh, 144 square inches, which is 12 by 12 inches, mm -hmm. visible from all four sides. Some guys put a, a flag on top, of, you know, like a four-way flag like yes. this, where you can see it from every direction. Uh, some put uh, patches patches on each side. And now, it, I don't believe Indiana's the only state that has this law because they're making ground blinds that have the Velcro strips built onto them, and the orange yes the orange uh, patches are coming with it, where you can stick them on. So a turkey season, you use the same line, get the orange off. But if you right. want to do it in deer farm season, you just put the orange on. Right. But yeah, it, you know, even if you have that, I need to go a little farther. You still have to have the hunter orange on your person. Yes. When you're inside that blind. Yes. It doesn't. It doesn't uh, take the Replace place of, of the regular hunter orange requirement. You still have to have the the hat, coat, cap, coveralls. Yes. You know, on at all times while you're hunting. Right. Um, so it's just an added measure because you get in that blind. And it, it obscures a hunter's view, and he may have he may be shooting a deer walking down a hillside, and if you're blended in, the with blind the, is back behind him. Well, the, well, yeah. the blind is meant to camouflage you, so you can't see it. Right. And you can't see the guy's hunter orange inside of it, and he shoots or runs a bullet right through the blind. So and, that and that's, that's not why intentional. We that. No, no. The, the deer may duck or bolt, and the well, the he, bullet even if he doesn't up, move, that bullet's going right through that deer. That's it's true. Keep going. That's true. You know, you got to make sure what's beyond that target also, yes. because a bullet. A deer won't stop most of the bullets we use right. for, for hunting deer in Indiana. Now that brings up another question. I know in some states it's okay to use a 30-30 to hunt deer, and in Indiana it's not. Right. So because I go in Kentucky, I take my 30-30 and I go hunting for deer, but here I can't do that. We, you know, for so. farm season we allow the traditional shotgun, uh, 410, 20, 28 just became legal, uh, 12 gauge, 10 gauge, those slugs, 16 right. gauge, anything from. 10 to 410 is legal with a, with a deer slug. And also we have the the, uh, the muzzle loader, the nice, the, yes. uh, which is a 44 caliber bullet or larger. Uh, and then the rifles that we allow in Indiana now start out as commonly used uh, cowboy action pistol cartridges. Yeah. But the way Indiana regulates it is the bullet has to be a 357 diameter. 
but the case length has to be between 1.16 and 1.8 inches long. So you have to measure the empty case length to determine if your firearm is legal. Right. You also need to check the regulations every year because they, they continually change. change that. Yes. And you know it, it it may become a day where 30 30 is legal. Right. I don't know. Um, you know that's that's just it takes someone or a group with enough interest to to ask for that for for those things to change if it's right. not detrimental to the herd or detrimental to the safety you know the hunters out there then the, the state's usually fairly open to those kind of changes but that's that's how Indiana's law is now where some confusion comes from is we also have handgun calibers that are legal right the handgun minimum bullet diameter is 243 and up so you can use a 234 243 handgun but you can't use a 243 rifle the rifle bullet still has to be 357 right. diameter or larger so well, read the regulations a, a lot of people need to ask questions before they go out in the woods and, and check the rules on, on ask, the website yeah you the, website, the website you know, the indiana.gov website just go to dnr fish and wildlife uh look at the the hunting brochures in there in a pdf file version or a word perfect version and then also early in the season when they when they first get printed you can find them at most sporting goods stores that sell licenses your walmarts uh, all of your state properties, uh, your state park offices, your fish and wildlife offices, right. reservoir offices, they all have uh, usually have an ample supply of those pamphlets that you can pick up and have a hard copy if you want to have it with you. So. so that's that's good to know. A lot of people try to come in from out of state and go hunting, and then they don't realize the rules because they're not the same as others. Every state has different rules. Oh, absolutely. So before you go to another state to hunt, whether it's on a friend's farm or or a, a game reserve, you need to need to call that state and find out what their rules are before you go out there. Exactly. Yeah, you know yeah, what the rules you know, are there. Hats off to our officers who are able to keep all this straight. I know I field a lot of phone calls in my office and it's, you know, sometimes I just amaze how they keep it all straight what oh. they what they do. But the hunting regs and and the regulations come out um, I, I can remember, the, you know, years ago where we used to wait for that Bible to come out. <laughs> uh, yeah, the we book. used to search everywhere for that book. Now, of course, now with, heck, we got our phones now yeah, right. and we got everything else there. you can get it on. Uh, so that's huge. And a couple other neat things that are also in with the, you know, it has our properties in there. Where right. public, if you don't have a place to hunt, gives you some suggestion there. Where you can hunt, check-in stations. Of course, we can check in online now. Uh, you know, uh, so I mean, it's got a wealth of information in there. And again, whether you're hunting or you're participating or you're just taking someone hunt, you know, brush up on those rules. I mean, they're important. I mean, again, whether you're taking someone out hunting, introducing them, and that's one thing we really wish is if every hunter in Indiana would take the time to introduce one new person to hunting, just think what that would do. Yeah. I mean, yes. it would really, uh, you know, through hunter education, we have we kind of call our logo uh, hunter education in Indiana tradition pass it on and I mean we're everybody's kind of tasked with that if each one of us would take one person or you know have our goal to introduce somebody not necessarily it has to be hunting but to a shooting activity or taking right. them out to you know like here in southern Indiana you know Clifty Falls I mean just taking them out in the field and, and enjoying what we have here I think we could really make a huge impact I mean there's so many things they can do on the computer or their Wii or whatever that they got at home now but just to sit back and enjoy what we have and I, you know, that's a challenge I'd like to, you know, really have everybody do. Just take right. that little extra time. Mm -hmm. But knowing the rules is huge. I mean, don't want to pay. When these guys come up, they want to shake your hand and say hi. Yeah. Not necessarily give you that citation. And they they want to hear the story about the big buck that got away or the or the. No, no, I want to see the big buck in the back of the truck. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, I don't. They want. I don't to, hear about the one that got away. What'd you miss for? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give yeah. you a hard time if you missed him. They but, want to uh, come and hear the stories yeah. and visit with you. They don't want to actually have to take you in for right. something you've done you shouldn't do. That's and right. you do have to admit. I mean, from years ago. Uh, incidents of poaching and everything have declined dramatically and we like to think that there's a lot of reasons why this has all happened and uh, again I mean the enforcement efforts the education efforts I mean the sportsmen taking pride in what they do right. I think it all becomes play a big portion in what's happening and again we wouldn't have this reversal of hunting trends if it wasn't for these efforts and everything right. so I think everybody who shares the love for the outdoors has got a hand in this and needs to feel pretty proud of what we're doing Right. And while we're talking about the education programs, uh, if someone's looking for a hunter education class or a boater education class or becoming out to a woman's event, yes. are they still on the event manager or yeah. on, on the website? The best place is our website. Uh, we have the, the Indiana Gov website. Right. Or another one that you can go to is the Indiana Hunter Education Association website. They've okay. kind of been a clearinghouse for us, too. Their website is www.in.com 
hea.com mm -hmm. and we always try to put all the activities and that up there and then your sign ups but if you're interested in, a, in one of our educational programs like Andy was leading to easy one to go to is indianahuntereducation.com right if you type that in it's going to give you an, an avenue there where you can click on traditional class you can click on online we do have an online available for 12 and older we still highly recommend a traditional classroom yes. uh, but for the ones that are have a lot of experience and need to maybe go out of state or something it's you know our military that's come in pretty handy uh, there is restrictions to the online course you have to be 12 years of age or, or right. older have to be an Indiana resident it's not open to folks from Kentucky or right. anybody so it is very specific but it gives you another option there and then you know what a lot of times our hunter ed card gets washed into washing machine <laughs> or it gets lost or lost the bill folder or so are you we fall in the creek or? exactly so we got a link on there too where you can get a replacement card replacement so cards. Indiana hunter education.com is is a good friend to have in your favorites or bookmark yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, it's the Southern Outdoors on WKM News. And uh, like I said, we're sponsored by Anderson Sales and Service today. We're going to take a little break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to Southern Outdoors on WKM News and uh, we're sponsored today by Anderson Sales and Service. Um, we were talking earlier about boating with the 4th of July weekend. We've got a lot of people are going to be out and about and uh, Madison's got the regatta going on. Right. So we want to make sure everybody stays safe on the water, you know, whether it's adults or kids. Um, if you're just out fishing or if you're just out for a boat ride, there's a lot of things you need to know. Right. right. When you, you know, you go out boating, whether it be on the river or, or on one of our in the lakes or whatever, the most important thing to remember is that you have your, your safety equipment. You yes. have your, your your life jackets. You have to have a wearable life jacket for everyone on board the boat. And that, that means it has to be the size of the people on the boat. Right. Um, and you can only have a certain number of people in each type of boat. Exactly. You your know boat, how many you can Your hold. boat has a, a capacity. There's a capacity plate somewhere on the boat. Yes. That tells you how many persons and, and, the, and the, the total weight. amount of weight. Uh, the amount of persons, if it says seven persons, that's based on a 150 pound person. Right. So uh, if it says four people and you put four people that you are my size, 215, 220, you've overloaded that boat. Yes. And if you put a cooler in there, you even more overloaded. The danger of an overloaded boat is that it, it lowers it in the water so much that instead of wanting to float, it wants to roll. Yes. And you get into some rough water situation or a quick shift in, in the weight of the boat, and it can roll right over, throwing right. you into the water, which you know, most boat accidents happen just that quick. Yes. Uh, if you're not wearing your life jacket, you don't have time to put it on. Uh, probably the biggest thing that, that I would say is have your life jacket readily accessible. Uh, there is a there is a push in some states, not Indiana, where they're thinking about passing laws where it's mandatory to wear a life jacket. Right. Um, in, in Indiana, the only time that, that that comes into play is on the Ohio River. Yes. If a person is under the age of 13, if they're 12 or under, and the boat is in operation, uh, or on the water, not anchored, not at the dock, or uh, if, if it's a large boat, if they're under the cabin, they don't have to. But a child of that age has right. to have their life jacket on at all times. So, uh, you know, anytime it's underway, and if the kids are out on the deck of a large boat, they have to have it on. Um, any boat over 16 foot in length yes. has to have what we call a Type 4 U.S. Coast Guard approved throwable device. And that is the square seat cushion with the two straps on it. When someone falls over, you can you pitch can, that. It's something thing. you can throw. That's why it's called a throwable. Yes. The other the other uh, type of Type 4 is like the round hard rings you see on, on large pasture boats or around swimming pools. Right. And then they're a hard shell, and you can throw that to them. Uh, <clears throat> we get a question a lot of times, and, and it, it's, I don't know where these where these come from, but the, you'll hear the same question. So it's being, being uh, you're talking about somewhere, do I have to have a 50-foot rope attached to it? No, you don't. It's a good idea because if yes. you throw it, how are you going to pull them back without the rope? Right. But the law says you have to have that throwable, one throwable per boat if it's over 16 feet in length. And that law is now in effect in all of Indiana. So anywhere you boat in Indiana, a wearable that fits everybody on board. You can't want to fit everybody. One size for every person who's on yes. board. Yes. Okay. If, you know, if I pull up and I check mom and dad and their their a four-year-old and their four-year-old has an adult type 3 life jacket. Well, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. <laughs> no. Exactly. It does not count. If if the life jacket is torn and ripped where the, the flotation material come out, it doesn't count. It's like not having one. 
So make sure your life jackets are in good working condition. Check the straps. Uh, the best way to keep them in good condition is to dry them out. Don't yes. leave them underneath the decking of the boat wet yeah. because the heat from the sun, it, it will dry rot that material and you'll be surprised you put it on just rip it, rip wide open. Or if you hit the water at a high rate of speed, yeah. it'll just rip open a flotation material just floating away from you and you've got a vest on with no flotation. So yeah. hey, that's the most important thing. The other things we check out there, of course you have to have a fire extinguisher. Uh, we want your registration valid. Yes. If you're on some of our inland state park reservoir lakes, you have to have a, a lake use permit, which is available at any, any of the DNR offices or online. And then uh, another thing on the river is at night, or any water at night, make sure your navigation lights work. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is check before dark, because electronics and boats, they just seem to short out a lot. Yeah. You know, and, and they work fine. Last time I used them, but I turned them on now, and my white light didn't work, and my red and green. That is the only way that another boater can tell what direction you're going on the right. water. It's the rules of the road. There's a reason that they're green and red and white. Mm -hmm. If it didn't matter, they could all be white. They could all be one color. Right. They could be blue. Well, they but need to know whether the boat's coming towards them or going away them. from them. It tells who has the right of way. If, if I'm looking at a boat in, in the dark and all I see is a green and a white light, I have the right of way. He's the give way vessel. If I see a red light and a white light, that means I have to give way to him. He yes. has the right of way. He's coming from the left and yes. going to the right. So that is that is is how I know uh, at night, since we don't have any lines in the roads and stuff like that, that's how you know if you have the right of way or not right. and who should. If all you see is a white light, you're behind somebody. Okay? And, and that's another thing a lot of people don't realize, that there are the lights are on the boats for that very reason. That's the only if reason. If you're out boating, it, it's not just there to light the way you're going. Right. It's so that other boaters know it. What you're doing. Exactly. As a matter of fact, on, on the water at night, if you have headlights on your boat, yes. you have less visibility than if you have no lights. Yeah. It actually blinds you. You can only see, it's like Within a group a campfire. Feet. If you're around a campfire, you can't see anything outside the light of that campfire. Right. It, it's, it blinds you. But at night, once your eyes will adjust to the darkness, reflections off the water, moonlight, yes. light from shore, you can see that you can see objects in the water is fine. Always watch for the guy that thinks his lights are working, but they're not. Right. And, and there's another thing you were talking about, the boat sitting too low in the water. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that you may be okay right now, but when another boat passes you, right. here now you've got the waves, and they're just going to come over top of that boat it, that you're in, and you're going to sink. Yes. So it being too low in the water is not good at all. No. Now, okay. you don't want to overload the boat because it makes it unstable. Yeah. They're designed only to hold so much weight. Yeah. So. And then, of course, you were talking about the life jackets, just so everybody remembers that the life jacket has to fit the person that it's on, right. and it, no, no rips or tears in it. And if it's a child, they can't slip out of it. Try to pick up the life vest and see if it'll come over their shoulders. You know, they can pull out of their arms. If, it, if that child can slip out of that vest on land, they're going to slip out of it in the water. So Right. If they're knocked unconscious going to water and their arms are limp, if they're in a large life vest that's not tight on them, yeah. Their arms will go right up and they'll slip out the bottom and the life jacket will be floating yeah. on top and they will not be. Yeah, so and you need to... That's why it needs, it needs to be a snug fit. Yeah. So. And then we have uh, several upcoming events that we have going on in Indiana. Oh yeah, yeah. we're right smack in the middle of summer here <laughs> and there's plenty coming up. Plenty to do. Uh, yeah, of course, traditionally in Indiana in August we have the Indiana State Fair and once again the DNR building. We have a, a very nice facility up at the State Fairgrounds. Uh, we have the DNR building where you can come. We have a fishing pond in back where uh, everyone can try their hand fishing. Uh, uh, the law enforcement division will have their booth again this year. And every year inside the building, we've always tried to do some kind of interactive shoot uh, it, that allows the public to try something they may right. have not have tried. So this year we're going to do archery again. Oh, it's very nice. popular. Uh, we'll have the archery range set up in there. and. Uh, we have a program in Indiana called the National Archery in the School Program that yes. we can talk again sometime on a program. But uh, what we're going to do is have our schools that are across Indiana that are participating, they'll actually come to the State Fair and they'll be in our booth and they'll highlight their school and they'll actually work with the public to allow them to shoot and let the, the students and everybody let uh, shoot. So it's really, <coughs> turns out really well. I think the fair runs like the August 1st through like the 18th. Okay. Uh, so everybody's welcome to come visit us at the DNR building. And then in September, the 20th and 21st, we have uh, what we call the Ford Hoosier Outdoor Experience. And this is going to be up at Ford Harrison State Park on the northeast corner of Indianapolis. Uh, it's a fantastic event. What we do is we showcase everything that we do in, in the Department of Natural Resources, yes. not only the Law Enforcement Division and our educational program. Once again, we'll be there and have yeah. the shooting activities. Uh, we'll have shotgun range open up. 
we'll have a uh, rifle range, we'll have an archery range, we'll have crossbow. Uh, so we'll have a whole thing. If you've never had an opportunity to do something like that, it's a great place to come. It's free to the public to come in. And is there an age limit to participate nope. in it? No, everybody, young or old again. Uh, can can go and try any of those out? Yep. Yeah. And the nice thing about the Hoosier Outdoor Experience, you don't have to worry about a parking spot. They've got these huge parking lots to park in. They yep. bus you into the into park. The park. So we don't have any traffic in the park, right. and 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 you don't have to worry about finding a parking space or getting back to your car. The buses are running constantly yeah. all day long, and hop on one, come in. When you want to leave, you hop on one, you go out. Oh. Got a trolley that'll take you around the. Mm -hmm. And the date Harrison, for that again right? is September twentieth and twenty first. It's a Saturday and Sunday, and uh, again, yeah, you know, needless to say, you know, we try to be age appropriate. But a lot of times we'll have that six year old who wants to try the shotgun, and our instructors are just dynamite. I mean, yes. I'll put our Indiana instructors up against any state. I mean, of course, maybe I'm a little biased or whatever, but these folks will get in there and they'll let that little fella come up and act like they're holding the gun, and what they're doing is actually shooting yes. it for them. Yes. But it's it's really amazing. Mom and dad's eyes will get this big and they'll walk away and high five, and, and that's what it's about. It's a, the Hoosier Outdoor Experience. Yeah. So invite you to come up there and of course there's a host of activities the rest of the year but those are our two big ones coming up next. I think that's wonderful for everybody involved. They can get a taste of what's going on and what they can access through your program and, and be safe and you don't have to go talk to them later. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So this is Debbie Crawford with Southern Outdoors on WKM News and I want to thank Andy Crozier for being with us today. You're welcome. And Tim Beck. My pleasure. And I've thoroughly enjoyed you guys being here. I'm sure we've given people a lot of information they didn't normally have. And uh, I want to thank Copeland's Complete Comfort for letting us film it here in the store and Anderson Sales and Service for their sponsorship today. And remember that uh, they're your outdoor vehicles. They actually have a sale going on. They have $100 off of their um, some of their sp special vehicles. So you have to go in and check and see which ones of those are on sale. and. Give them a visit and uh, next time we're going to have uh, Gary Copeland and we'll have some other things going on as far as uh, going out and filming hunting shows with people, uh, cooking co shows as uh, cooking out and uh, more safety courses. We need all the safety courses that we can uh, access to so when there'll be uh, websites and phone numbers if you have any questions and remember there's no dumb question except the one that's not asked because it doesn't have an answer so be sure and join us on Southern Outdoors on WKM News. Mm -hmm.